Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people as the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting this evening. And I'd like to recognize their unique contribution to our environmental and cultural heritage, past, present, and future. And I would also like to recognize this meeting place as Yindiyamara and Gulawe, a respectful meeting place committed to improving lives for the common good. Well, welcome everybody uh, to tonight's Provocations Public Lecture, uh, co-hosted with the Royal Society of New South Wales and Charles Sturt University. Welcome to both um, our online audience, we have about 200 people registered for this event, um, and also to you, um, our face-to-face -face audience. My name is Mark Evans, uh, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research here at Charles Sturt, um, and your host for this evening. Uh, Provocations is a series of public lectures, panel discussions, and a blog series written by prominent thinkers that seek to address some of the great intellectual, environmental and social issues of our time. Issues confronting Australia, our region and the world. Um, indeed, I'd like to take this opportunity this evening to direct you to the Provocations blog at Provocations at CSU. Um, where you'll see the, the line, shared wisdom for solving the problems of today and tomorrow. Um, so there you'll find a, a series of provocations aimed at challenging orthodox thinking written by provocateurs such as Clive Hamilton, Sharon McLeod, Wayne Hus Hudson, um, and Patrick Wolf Walsh. Um, on each topic, of course, we, we encourage reasoned online engagement and debate, and Lee's provocation uh, will be published there at a later date. Um, this evening's lecture will further strengthen our range of provocations. Entitled Thirst for Power, the Rivers of Conflict in Southeast Asia, uh, Professor Baumgartner is passionate, clearly, about um, healthy rivers. His mantra, a healthy river is an economic and environmental engine, has been the topic of his recent research and engagement. He has written for the conversation, sat on parliamentary inquiries, been appointed to prime ministerial advisory panels, and extensively consults with communities, including school groups, um, to communicate the science on river management. Lee is also active in international and national media and works with both television and written press to convey his passion for healthy rivers. But most importantly, and very relevant to his topic tonight, he has been working across the Indo-Pacific region, helping our regional partners and neighbours tackle a range of issues relating to river management, specifically the development of rivers and solutions which allow irrigation, industry, and the environment to coexist. Um, a former Aspire nominee and winner of several national and international awards, Lee holds a PhD in applied ecology from the University of Canberra, and he's worked in both academia and the government on, on water issues. Um, he's published over 180 scientific publications and secured over $40 million in competitive funding in his career. Uh, but I should say on a, on a personal note, um, Lee is just a fantastic colleague who inspires us all every day with his passion for his research, the sense of duty of care for his colleagues, and his creative leadership. It's an absolute delight to work with Lee. So thank you, Lee, for everything you do for the university. So tonight, Lee's gonna to be talking about the conflict between economic development and healthy rivers, and he'll highlight a significant challenge which the Indonesian government 
faced and is solving in partnership with international collaborators. Um, and after Lee finishes his presentation, we've got some key representatives from Indonesia with us tonight, and we're going to have um, a panel discussion um, around um, this particular issue that's required very, very significant skill in terms of negotiation between community, industry, and government. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Lee Baumgartner. Firstly, Mark, thank you so much for that very warm introduction and thank you to everyone for, for joining us this evening. Mark approached me several months ago and said, would you be interested in doing a provocations lecture? And I said, absolutely. I said, what would you like me to talk about? And he said, well, he goes, I really want you to focus on the international work that you're doing, but I want you to say something that's provocative. I want it to be relevant to Australia. And I want you to impart a message to people that's going to change the way that they might think and behave. It's not very easy when you do that. And so I've spent the last few months sitting down thinking about what we would talk about tonight. And, I, and I'm very honoured tonight to have our Indonesian colleagues here because uh, they have absolutely helped me understand a solution, which is ex a, a problem actually, is just very relevant to Australia, but is happening in Indonesia, which is not far from our doorstep. So, uh, so tonight we're going to explore water security, but we're probably going to explore the topic of water security in a way that you haven't thought about before. Now, I was, in, I was in year five when I first heard this statement. It's from a guy called Ishmael Sarah Gelden, who is, is actually quite famous in water circles. This guy, he's been at the World Bank, he's been at the CGIAR, he's been the chairman of the Global Water Commission. If anyone knows anything about water, it's this guy. And uh, I remember my year five teacher telling me that the, the future wars will be fought over water. And I thought, well, that's crazy. You know, this is a guy, I was just a kid at school in Geelong. Water was everywhere. It rained every day in Geelong. You turned the tap on and there was water. There was water everywhere. Why would we be fighting wars over water? And it wasn't until I actually entered the, the scientific career and understood water that water is an absolutely precious resource. And uh, there's lots of things we need in our lives to live. But there's one thing absolutely you need to live, and that's water. And you, you can't last as a human, you can't last longer than three days without water. If there's anything, one absolute thing that is needed for life, it is water. And um, it's probably the one thing we undervalue the most because in ver various areas, there's so much of it. And so tonight I'm going to talk about water security and what that means for us really as a globalized society. And when I talk about water security, most people think about water security as do I have enough water to drink? That's the basic thing that people think about. But as a society, it's much more complex than that. You need water for, you need water for urban water for, for cities. All aspects of cities run on water. And I'll, I'll give you some very poignant examples of that tonight. Water is a commodity that's traded and people make money off water. It's needed for domestic water supply. It's needed for industry. It's needed for agriculture. It's needed for almost everything that's done in society. It's needed for microchips for the cars you drive, for the computers you use, is all dependent on water to use. And so water security is much more than water to drink. Society at the moment demands so much from its limited resource of water. And with climate change approaching, all the predictions are saying we're going to be seeing significant water stress across the globe within the next 20 years. But we've seen it in droughts and floods that we've been having recently that the, the water stress during droughts, there's not enough of it. During floods, it's poor quality. And so we're starting to see that as climate change takes hold. And so we have to plan for this as a society and we have to, to make sure that we have enough water. The other thing that's putting pressure on water is us people. There's more of us now than there ever have been. There's, it's growing, it's exponentially heading towards nine billion people and we've got less water to share around those people. And this is, this is a map of the world based on population size. And a lot of the water stress is going to be happening in those very populous countries. But countries like Australia and America and, and developed countries, a lot of Europe, are absolutely dependent on some of these very populous countries for things that seemingly don't have anything to do 
with day-to-day -day life or survival. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk about fast fashion. I'm going to talk about the army because the title of my talk had rivers of conflict and I had to somehow work the army in there. I'm going to talk about awesome politicians, some people who are actually making a massive difference by making some strong decisions. I'm going to talk about people power, is mobilising people to make a difference. And as you'll all find out, I've got a bit of a man crush on this dude, and I'm going to explain why. He's a pretty amazing guy. So what is fast fashion? I've come tonight dressed in fast fashion. It's not overly expensive. It's everywhere. It's fairly... It can be fashionable. It can not be fashionable. It's something that goes from the factory to the shop as quickly as possible. It's something that, once it's in the shop, is out of season very quickly and replaced by the next season's fashion. It goes in cycles. You see sales in the stores because that was last year's pair of shorts. You have to buy this year's pair of shorts, and it changes. I don't know how many times in my life corduroy has come back into fashion, and it's going to happen again soon because that's fast fashion. It goes in cycles and it comes back. And... You're probably all thinking tonight, what on earth does fast fashion have to do with water? And that's what the rest of this presentation is going to be about. And, and I'm going to draw a little bit of inspiration for this talk from a, a video documentary that was produced by the, the German media organisation Deutsche Welle. They actually blew the lid off this uh, in the mid-2010s when they, when they released this article. And I've got some clips tonight from that which are going to show why this is, why this is so significant. And the reason I'm grateful that our Indonesian colleagues are here is that I'm going to focus on an Indonesian river called the Chitarum River. And the Chitarum River is really, some of you may have never heard of the Chitarum River, and after tonight you're going to understand how relevant the Chitarum River is to every single person in this room. So for those of you who have been to Indonesia, uh, I guess some, have some, most of you have been here to Indonesia? Show of hands. Not too many people, that's interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the main islands in Indonesia, Java Island. Java Island is the most populous island of Indonesia. For those of you who have been to Bali, that's where Bali is, right there. And, and this part of the Java Island here is the Chitarum River. The Chitarum River, by way of comparison, is about the same size as the Yarra River catchment in Melbourne. If anyone knows the Yarra, it's almost the same size catchment it's the same length. I think it differs in length by about 10 kilometres, the two rivers. So it's not a huge river, um, but it's very important. It just so happens to be almost the world's most populated river. In that catchment, around that catchment in the province of West Java, which is in West Java Island, today there are 55 million people that live in that one catchment, in that one catchment. And so... Back in the year 2000, there was 35 million people. So in that catchment, and I'm going to give you an idea of the scale of that catchment, it has increased by almost the population size of Australia in the last 20 years. So if I go with my Victorian analogy, there's the map of Victoria, and the overlay of Victoria there is Java Island. So that's an outside of Java Island. If I look at the Chitterum catchment, there's... Right now, 52 million people living in an area of that size. It's a phenomenal population. And anyone who has ever been to Java Island, and we were joking about this at dinner last night, knows what the traffic is like at that place. It is unbearable. But imagine the area from Mount Gambia to almost Adelaide full of 52 million people. And that's what happens every day in that area. The reason there are so many people there is because over the last 30 years, it was heavily industrialised. Lots of factories were built. The factories were built in that area and people came to the factories to work. The large number of factories I'm going to talk about are textile factories. They're, they're factories which produce fabric. Every factory in this catchment, and there's 600 of them in this catchment, employs about four to 5,000 people. They have 
production schedule. So these things are just churning out fabric day and night without stop. And in that catchment, it's producing much of the world's, the much of the world's fabric. And I'll show everyone actually how much is happening. What happened is that the population exploded in that part of Indonesia quicker than you could put services to satisfy that. So all of the things we take for granted, uh, sanitary systems, garbage collections, all of the things that you take for granted don't exist in this catchment. And when you've got a very small part, like if you squeeze this into Victoria and said, we're going to do that with absolutely no services, it's going to grow exponentially. Unfortunately, that's what happens. And in the mid 2010s, this is what the Chitterum catchment looked like. This was day to day life for people who lived in that catchment. You can see what the kids are swimming in there. You can see what the fishermen had to put up with. It, it, it's pretty nasty. It's as bad as a river can get. So Deutsche Welle sent a, a reporter over there to try and understand what was happening in this catchment and to try and talk about whether this explosion of textiles factories and this explosion of population actually having an impact and what the impacts were. But in order to do that, they wanted to see what each factory did. So they snuck some cameras into a factory. This is a factory uh, from a company called Gistex. This is the biggest factory that's based on that river. And the Gistex factory, they snuck some cameras in and they did a little bit of a, little bit of a tour with the factory superintendent. So I'll show a bit of footage from that. It goes for about a minute. But the company agrees to let us in. 4,500 people work here. Gistex produces mainly polyester fabric, a synthetic material that requires a lot of chemicals. So it's a bit loud, so we cannot talk. Mr. Welly runs this factory, one of three Gistex sites in Indonesia. The group works mainly with large clothing stores. In these buildings, 1,000 machines operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Produces nearly three million meters of fabric a month for the whole world. Each of these machines processes the wires with water filled with chemicals. The wastewater then flows to the settling tanks shortly. So 40 litres of water per t-shirt, and if you just look around the room now, there's a lot of water being produced just to clothe everyone in this room. Three kilometres of fabric every month is produced by that factory, which is a phenomenal amount. That company, Gistex, and this is from the website a few days ago preparing for this talk, presently supplies to 25 countries around the world. And so um, I sat down the other day with this global country shader I found on the web. And that's what that looks like. This one factory in West Java, Indonesia, is currently providing that fabric to that much of the world every month, every single month. And that's one factory. And in that catchment, there's 599 more doing something similar. It's absolutely phenomenal, the impact that has. You then go further into the Gistex website and you go, well, who's actually buying that fabric? And you start to find out some familiar logos. All right, let's, who's been to H&M? Who's likely, who's been to Adidas and has been wearing Adidas now? Yeah, these, these, are, these are almost household names, some of these. And this factory was producing fabric to do that. Okay, so did, has anyone, there was only a few who have been to Bali. Has anyone, does anyone own one of these? <laughs> and you might not own one of these, but 
you might have been to something like this if you've been to Bali. 40 litres per shirt. Now, not only is that factory producing fabric for the world, it's also producing fabric for Bali. And so you see a lot of people go, oh, we went to Bali and oh, we haggled over a shirt and that was a fun experience, but it's good because it's benefiting the Balinese. Sure, it's benefiting the Balinese, but the Balinese aren't producing the shirts. The shirts are being produced several hundred kilometres away, and that's where the impact is. And it's a very, very, very thirsty process. So effectively, to run a factory that's producing that much fabric, you are drawing a lot of water from the river. You're then adding a whole bunch of chemicals to that. It might be acid to fix some of the dyes. You're adding a lot of dye to the, to the water to stain the fabric. And then and we'll see how much of this is actually being produced. This produces a whole bunch of wastewater. You've got two options with that. You either fork out for a very expensive treatment process to treat that water, or you just dump it somewhere. What does that mean in a supply chain sense? Well, there's so much water that's being used. Now, you've got to think that for some of this, now this is a polyester factory. If you've got a cotton factory, there's even more water because you have to grow the cotton. Then that cotton has to be transported to the factory. Then the factory produces it. Then the factory ships it. When you add up the entire supply chain for clothes, for a shirt and a pair of pants, it's 20,000 litres of water. 20,000 litres of water for just a shirt and a pair of pants. And this has been scientifically calculated to be accurate. It would take you 13 years to drink that much water, just to produce that. The impact of fast fashion globally on our water supplies is massive, absolutely massive. And this is what it looks like outside the factory. So you've got all of those machines I just showed you in there producing all of this. Then outside, you've got these treatment stations that the water's being churned through. Now, the goal of the factory is to treat that water as quick as possible to get it into as healthy a, a situation as possible at the cheapest possible rate to maximise your profits. And that's what it looks like a little closer up. These big dye stilling stations, these aerating pools, um, treatment parts to try and get as many chemicals out as possible. Now, we're going to go back to the rest of the tour that they did with Mr. Welly, the superintendent of the textile factory. And so they actually did a tour of the wastewater treatment part of the Gistex factory. And this is what they found. Treatment. So our wastewater treatment, the size is uh, 50 meter width and 100 meter length. And then the depth is around 6 meter. How many meters do you use a day? It's around uh, 200 meter cubic per hour. Which is more than 3,300 liters per hour. So what kind of parameters do you analyze in the wastewater? The pH, the turbidity, the color, suspended solid, and the COD. Do you look for uh, plumbum, cadmium, lead, uh, heavy metals? Not every day. Only five daily parameters, while international standards provide at least 31. So this is the water that goes into Shikari? Yes. So is it drinkable? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, not, it's not harmful, it's maybe not drinkable. Yeah, still need to be filtered if you want to drink, but I mean, it's okay. You can touch, but for me, visual control is water check, I take, I put in the head if I don't get itchy. If I don't get itchy, then it's good. That's the superintendent of the biggest fabric, fabric producer in the Chitterum catchment. And this was in the mid 2010s. And this was happening almost at every single factory on that river. I don't get itchy, it's good. So there was a significant amount of water use in these factories and there was far too much water used to generate the three kilometers of fabric per month that could be realistically treated so what were the companies doing? That's exactly what they were doing. And if you talk to the locals about, if you talk to the locals about this, they say the river flows the colour of the fabric they're producing that day. And that's what was happening. All of those tradies shirts you see at the shop that they flow fluoro. You know, 
this, is, this was happening in the Cheetah Room in the mid-2010s. And it was out of control. It was like the Wild West. So every single factory is discharging this. And it wasn't just Indonesia. It was also Bangladesh, Cambodia, India, China, all of those countries that are producing large amounts of fabric. And that's the result. The result is rivers that have bits of fur floating around in them, rivers that are different colours, that are mixed, huge fish kills. It wasn't particularly good. And so what was the outcome of that, of that, uh, of that article by Deutsche Welle? Global headlines about the Chitterum River. And it was dubbed the world's most polluted river because of that. And so, unfortunately, well, fortunately, it, it actually showed what was happening in that catchment. And it needed to happen because that's not sustainable for anyone. That's not sustainable for the local people. That's not sustainable for the ecology. That's not even sustainable for the factories. At some stage, the water would become so unusable even for generating textiles that it wouldn't have been used. But the Indonesian government didn't like having the world's most polluted river in its backyard. And so the Indonesian government sprung immediately into action. The Indonesian government, and this is where the story starts to turn, established a task force. So the president, Joko Wee, at the time said, this isn't good enough. We have to fix up this catchment. He talked to my man crush, Ridwan Kamil, who was the governor of West Java at the time, and said, you have to take control of this and you have to fix it up. Indonesia's not going to have the world's most river. So he, he assembled, it said, did the, it's called the, uh, the one command approach, which is almost like you know, the Dan Andrews approach to COVID. Right, they did this in the Chitterum River. What they did was, they called in the army, and that green box represents the military command. So they actually called the Indonesian army to come in and help with this problem. They then mobilized all of, the, all of the police in the West Java region, and they said, they passed a law to say, polluting the Chitterum is now a criminal activity. You're not going to get away with it anymore. And these yellow boxes down the bottom, they assembled about 7,000 people. There's this green army of legal members, people, artists, volunteers, college students, you name it. Everyone got mobilised into a green army and they said, we're going to fix this problem. All under the command of Ridwan Kamil. Now, I just wanted to make a point about Ridwan Kamil. He's a pretty popular dude. The first, actually, thanks to Pak Araf, and we'll talk to Pak Araf after, we actually met with him last year, and this is where I, I, I learned about this story. The first thing he said to us is, I've got 21 million Instagram followers. And that's a lot, because I looked, up, I looked up Donald Trump yesterday and he only has 23 million. And so... He's got five and a half million Twitter followers. He's got a big TikTok account. This guy's pretty famous. And probably not a single person in this room has heard of this guy. But he's one of the most influential figures in Indonesia. So when do you get a guy who's a very popular politician who says, this isn't good enough and we're going to fix it? Things actually happen. He divided the entire Chitterum catchment up into command areas. And he sent out basically the army to different parts of the river. He sent out the police to check out the factories. He sent out the people to start cleaning up and mobilized probably what is and probably still is to this day the biggest ever river cleanup in the world. The army turned up with boats, with barges, organized everything, and they started removing rubbish from the river. They had floating excavators on the river to scoop out tons and tons of rubbish. I mean, look at that. There's rubbish bags and all sorts of things there. They got fishermen and paid fishermen to start cleaning up the river. Locals would start doing this. So slowly, bit by bit, they started to remove all of this from the river. And then uh, they mobilized this army, but they also put in place very, very strong laws with strong compliance systems. So... We're now going to hear from Governor Ridwan Kamil, or former Governor Ridwan Kamil, about his approach to cleaning this up. Dulu sekali masih bandel, warning dua kali masih bandel, warning ketiga langsung di beton. Ya. Jadi ada tindakan represif untuk mengingatkan bahwa anda sudah di warning ada pencemar. Nah, setelah di beton masih juga melakukan tindakan-tindakan pelanggaran. 
masuklah kepolisian ya untuk mengusut uh, tindakan-tindakan kriminalitas lingkungan. Terdiri dari tahun lalu sekitar 4, 263, tahun ini ada 47, total 300-an lah ya. So we actually said it's not good enough to pollute the river. You're a criminal if you pollute the river, and I'm going to do something about it. He, um, it was a pretty phenomenal job because he said, as he said there, the number of violations dropped off. The, the factories actually had to comply. They actually had to start treating their water. They had to stop releasing bad water into the river, and they had to start improving things. And if you look at what happened, and it was about a six-year period, with the army working every day, with the Green Army working every day, with the police stopping the factories, the, the Chitterum River went from that to that in six years. Phenomenal effort to clean it up. And um, it, it really is a good success story. But the problem isn't solved unless you address the root cause. And so lots of people then said, well, how do we help sustain this? Cleaning it up is okay, but you don't just want it all to come back. Um, when it doesn't, when the way you're fixing up the problem ends. So th this is a map of, that was produced by Monash University. Monash said you actually have to have rubbish collection, you have to have a septic system, you have to deal with your animal waste up in the catchment, you have to have community recycling centres, all of this stuff. And so on the back of all of this was a massive community education program. People learned about the things that they had to do and the behaviours they had to change to fix this up. CSU is even playing a role, and uh, Dr. Anna Horta, who's here tonight, is at the moment working on the Chitterum River and uh, looking at mapping all of the infrastructure across the river and saying, now that the river is starting to be cleaned up, how can we actually improve the health of the river by addressing some of the point sources? And this is really good to see CSU playing a role here. Industry has to play a role. Now, this is a map here of the, this is the global supply chain for fast fashion. You go from extracting the raw materials to getting into the factories to then trucking it to the retail place, then people use it, then they get rid of it, some people recycle it, they throw it out, it might get recycled. The global supply chain is actually massive. Um, it's, it's the biggest industry in the world. So I was then interested in, well, what's Australia's role in all of this? And so this is an interesting story about Kmart. In 2017, Kmart announced they were moving all of their factories from China to West Java in Indonesia. Where to? The Chitterum River. So Kmart actually went in and they said, we're going to do this. We were going to get cheaper clothes from Kmart because they were going to produce them cheaper in Indonesia than they were producing them in China. And it's cheaper to ship them here because they're not coming from China, they're coming from Indonesia, which is only a five hour flight. And so I've gone, okay. What is the extent of this? And so on the weekend, I was in Canberra with my daughter, Ava, who's here tonight. We went to Kmart. And we walked around Kmart and we started looking at all of the clothes. And um, this is one thing I've done since learning about this is I'm obsessive now when I go clothes shopping. I flip tags all the time. And so we walked down the aisle and we looked around at how many 40 litre t-shirts were sitting there. I mean, there's still a phenomenal amount of water use that's happening in one Kmart, in Belconnen, in Canberra, multiply that by all the Kmarts in Australia, it's still a lot of water use. Then we started looking at the tags themselves and we go Bangladesh, Indo, Indo, and we started looking at them all and it was the same thing, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, all around Kmart. So, so all of the clothes that we're wearing here tonight, and if anyone's wearing any Kmart clothes, They've come from one of those three countries because that's where the supply chain is. And so the fast fashion that we are wearing here in Australia is impacting the rivers in Southeast Asia. And that's probably the biggest, the biggest light bulb moment I've had in my career is that you can't escape this. And I, I've been doing a lot of research over the last, oh, over the last 20 years that's been funded by the Australian government. And one of the big criticisms I get is, why are we spending our tax dollars overseas? We should be spending it here. This is why you spend it overseas, because we're completely dependent on this for our fast fashion addiction. So the work that we're doing over there is trying to solve a problem that we're causing or we're contributing to. It's such a light bulb moment when you, when you actually understand it.
The good thing about Kmart, now I'm not going to hang too much on Kmart because they actually did their due diligence. And this is after the Deutsche Welle, this is after the Deutsche Welle investigation. So Kmart did pre-checking of all of the factories and they made sure that they only bought fabric from the factories that were compliant with Ridwan Kamil's laws. They made sure that they were compliant with that. They then developed an ethical sourcing and transparency policy. And I found this on the weekend on the Kmart website. You go onto the Kmart website, it lists every single factory that it sources from. And it's incredibly transparent. Right down to the, right down to the street names in Indonesia, where they get them from. And so we've even seen over the last five years this change in the way retailers are dealing with this issue. I then went down to the surf and ski shop in Albury here, and I saw this interesting tag, because now all I do is flip tags when I walk. That, everyone goes shopping and I go flipping tags. And I see this thing, For the Planet, and I start reading the tags and seeing what they're talking about. And so there's actually some companies now that are only manufacturing and only buying sustainable uh, equipment and materials. Other companies have now changed the way that they produce the fabric. Um, Superdry, everyone might have heard of the Superdry brand, they actually 100% reuse, the, it's all recycled material. So it's not using water, it's using the byproduct of previous materials to generate the clothes. There's now waterless, so they've even changed the process for some factories. You can actually make fabric now without water, which is amazing. And then I found out about this Blue Sign project. Now this is something that, you know, you walk around the supermarket now, if you're buying eggs, you can buy cage eggs, you can buy free range eggs, you can buy all sorts of different eggs and it's, it's labelled on your eggs. You can't actually buy clothes that have a tag on them that says this is sustainable, this is water sustainable, this is sustainably grown cotton or sustainably spun polyester. But this guy in Switzerland developed this, it's like getting the Heart Foundation tick for your t-shirt. It's, it's like a certification scheme that he's trying to launch globally. So if you see anything now with a blue sign on the tag, that means it's 100% sustainable. So it's a way of helping consumers make smart choices about what they're doing. The problem is it's not mainstreamed. At the moment, we've, we probably know more about the eggs we're buying than we do about the clothes we're wearing and where that things come from. But it's a start. So just to wrap up, what, what, are, what are a few things, if, if you were to walk away with one, you only remember one slide tonight, and I guarantee you're going to remember a hell of a lot more than one slide because this, this is just an amazing story, is educate yourself. I had no idea that this was, was an issue until I learnt from my Indonesian colleagues and watched the Deutsche Welle, which is now on YouTube, that's where I borrowed for education purposes, all of that footage. Um, you can educate yourself fairly quickly about the choices you're making. Flip tags. This is a new hobby of mine. Flip tags. See where, the, where, where, the, where they're produced. See if it's sustainable. Donate if you're not going to wear it. And one thing I found out during this week in railing, there is a phenomenal amount of clothes. Over 50% purchased worldwide are worn once. You buy them for a wedding. You buy them for a function. And that's it, you don't ever wear them again. There's a phenomenal amount of clothes that are only ever worn once and then either turfed out or taken down to Vinnie's. Donate them, don't throw them out. Shop responsibly, understand what you're buying. Travel regionally, and, and I, I can't stress this enough. I didn't know much about this until I went to Indonesia and saw it with my own eyes and spoke to people on the ground who were dealing with this. It does pay, if you go to Bali, get out of the tourist place and go and have a look at things. If you go to Java, Go and see the Chitta Room catchment. It's beautiful. It's, um, and the people like talking about this. And then educate others. So if there's one thing you can do tonight after leaving here tonight, you can go and say, I learned something about fast fashion tonight, and I learned something about water management in Southeast Asia. Now, Mark started with an acknowledgement of country. I'm going to finish with an acknowledgement of someone who's a pretty amazing person, um, based up in Wagga Wagga, if anyone knows Auntie Cheryl Penrith. She's, she's a good friend to see she, We see her at a lot of our events. She does a lot of our welcomes to countries. She's a, she's a pretty inspirational woman, but Auntie Cheryl unashamedly only wears recycled clothes. She shops at Vinnie's all the time. Very stylish, the stuff she gets from Vinnie's, because a lot of it's only been worn once. And 
she started this, uh, she started this exhibition in Wagga just to say, what are the benefits of doing it? So you've got someone in Wagga Wagga trying to make a difference in this area. If a lot of people took a leaf out of Arnie Sherrill's book, we'd be doing a, a big part for rivers in Southeast Asia. So I hope you like my story as much as I like telling it. I, it's something that <laughs> once you see it, you can't unsee it. And that, that's kind of what I've taken out of this experience for me. And um, again, I, I just want to thank Dr. Arif and the colleagues here from Indonesia for, for help telling me this story and for help uh, introducing me to Governor Ridwan Kamil and seeing how the power of well-implemented policy and a strong-willed politician who can harness the people can actually do good. So you can't hang it all on politicians because there's some, actually some really good ones out there who are making the world a better place. So thank you very much for listening.